Well, uh, we are starting a new series this morning called Church Life, and we're going to be looking at the book of Acts for the next few weeks, a few months actually, and uh, this is another series that as I was praying where to go next, I thought this book would really help us navigate some of these tricky and, and strange, unique times that we're in. Uh, and this is what I'm, this morning it will we're going to look at one verse Acts one eight and it really will serve more like an overview for the whole book and you'll see what I'm talking about shortly. But th- this is some of the reasons why I wanted to study this book. One is I was thinking, man, how this is so unique because there are things that we should value as a church, which are spelled out in Acts, but we live in a time where valuing one seems to affect another. I'll show you what I mean. Look at this list. There's a list of seemingly competing values right now. We are called to worship together. The scriptures teach us that. So we're worshiping together, but we're also called to love our neighbors, to love our neighbor as ourself. We're also called to obey governing authorities over us through Romans and Hebrews 13. We're called to be a good witness in our community, to be salt, to be a city on a hill. And we're also called to fellowship with one another. We'll look at that more next week. So what happens when we live in a world where doing one of these things seems to affect the other? We're doing number one, but number one seems to have an impact on number three. How do we juggle that? Or what happens when, if we do number two, and how do we do number five at the same time? How do we love our neighbors if we're all together and there's this contagious outbreak that's taking place? So how do you juggle church life in this crazy season that we're in? So we're going to look at the book of Acts. We're going to look at the early followers of Christ, navigate some of these issues in this series we're going to call church life. And first I want to clarify where the term church came from because, you know, Peter and John, they didn't wake up and say, hey, Peter, look at the time. It's it's time for church. You going to church today? They never used terminology like like that. Yet, they would use the word church, and they would have used the Greek word ekklesia, and it never would have referred to a building when they would have used it. It always would have referred to the people of God, a gathering of people. That was the church. It was never a building until much later. And so the book of Acts is a, church, is a book about the ecclesia, the people of God. And as they grow without programs, without buildings, they had gatherings, Solomon's Port, other places where they gathered in homes. And yet Christianity has grown to be the largest religion in the world because this ecclesia, this, this early group of believers spread and did it the right way. And so, this morning I want to highlight really the two components, the power and the purpose of the church. We're going to look at that as we look at Acts 1-8 this morning. So Acts 1-8, here it is in a nutshell. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So... Acts 1.8 is one of those verses that church planners, missionaries, this is the mission statement verse of many churches. This is what we want to do. We're going to trust God for the power to be his witnesses, and it's going to be this inside-out thing. If you notice, it starts in Jerusalem. That's where they're currently at. It spreads to Judea, Samaria, the regional areas, and then to the ends, ends of the earth. It goes global after that. And so all these churches are like, that's what we want. We want this. We got an Acts 1-8 church, and that's the kind of fellowship that we want to have. We want to have a fellowship that trusts God for power to be his witnesses that starts here and expands to the globe. And I'd say that's great. It's a great mission, vision statement. It really is. And the truth is, I don't know. This is it. This is God. God picked this one. So you can't. You can't pick another one and be lined up biblically. So that's what we're going to see in this first few chapters of Acts. We're going to see the church in Jerusalem. The first few chapters is all these stories about the Acts of the Apostles that take place in Jerusalem. And then you're going to see it expand to Judea and Samaria. And then you're going to see Paul decide to take these missionary journeys. 
you're going to see it go global. You're going to see it expand outside of this area to other places. But one of the most important things to remember when studying this is that the power comes from God. That they will receive power. In other words, they were very excited about the mission before they got the, the, the commission to go. They just saw Jesus rise from the dead. I mean, you're talking about pumped up. They were afraid, but once they saw a resurrected Jesus, you can't frighten them with death. They are pumped up, and then Jesus is like, I want you to stay here in Jerusalem, wait for power, and when you have that power from God, I want you to go be my witnesses. And that's what happens. And here's something else I want to point out. The reason or the purpose of having the power is so that they would be witnesses. Without the power, they can't be a witness, and without their willingness to want to, to try to be a witness, there is no power either. They work together. Uh, earlier this, this week, um, I, I had one of those issues. You ever have one of those where you're at your house and you're thinking, it's a little warmer than it usually should be? And I realized that my air conditioning unit was down. It was like, oh, yeah, it's a lot warmer than it usually is up here, and you're starting to sweat a little bit. And I talked to a trustee, I talked to, to Tim Mills here, talked to him on the phone, and, and Tim is a, a, a genius at those kind of things that I know nothing about. But, but what had happened is, is I, and I'm going to explain this wrong, Tim will correct me afterwards, but there was like this, this pan that I have that, that collects water, and, and if there's something stopped up, whether it was from condensation or things that happened, uh, air, con air conditioning units have a drain and it was, it was clogged up and it was backing up and when it, the pan at the bottom of my unit would fill up with water, there was a switch that it would trigger and shut the unit off. It would no longer get power when that water level raised so high and it would flip the switch and all of a sudden this unit has no power. And it's interesting because when a unit has no power, listen, the sensor shut it off. It doesn't matter how big the unit is. It doesn't matter how many vents run through the house. It doesn't matter how much advanced technology and all these wonderful things about it. If the unit has no power, it's nothing but a display. That unit, it had no power until Tim came over and worked on it. And that we were designed that without the Holy Spirit, we have no power. We're only a display apart from God's power, empowering the church, empowering believers. And so I want to talk about how did we get that power. So a little bit of a history lesson. So here's my definition of, of power. Power is the place where God dwells. What I mean, when God shows up in a place, it's empowered. So let's do a little bit of a history lesson. Early on, you know, we're, we're going Old Testament when the children of Israel were led out of Egypt to the promised land, during that time, God had given Moses instructions to build a tabernacle. And this tabernacle had all these things. I won't go into the details, but there was an outer court, a holy place, a holies of holies, and there was the Ark of the Covenant. And God said, this is where I dwell. And you set this tent up in this tabernacle and you can meet with me. And in the tabernacle, there were all these rituals, cleansing rituals that helped actually prepare the way for Christ. But they would do all these cleansing rituals and ceremonies and they would meet with God in that way. Fast forward a little bit. They finally were able to build the temple, Solomon's temple. David started it, Solomon finished it. And it was a place where you could express your worship. Same rituals that were done for cleansing were done at the temple and they would come in, and people would travel from miles away just to come to the temple to worship God, especially on the Day of Atonement. You would come in, and that was true for the tabernacle as well. There was a day where you would, uh, the sins, your sin debt was paid for by someone else's sacrifice. And people would come from all around to come to the temple to offer sacrifices. Now fast forward a little further. On the day that Jesus was crucified, there was this veil in the temple, the same veil that separated the ho uh, most holy place from the holies of holies. And then that veil, only the high priest could go behind that once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer sacrifice for you on behalf of the people. And so on uh, the day that Christ was crucified, that veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It symbolized that now we have access to meet with God 
in a way that we never could have before. And all that ritual that was set up before in the Old Testament through the tabernacle and the temple was fulfilled in the person of Christ. And so now suddenly the place where God dwells goes from the tabernacle, and it was all symbolic to show this is where God's going to show up in the tabernacle, in the temple, and now you, me, believers, regenerate people, people who place their faith in the person of Jesus Christ have access to God, and God's Holy Spirit dwells in us. It seals us. It is without, or I should say he seals us. The Holy Spirit of God, without the Holy Spirit of God, we're none of his. So when a person trusts Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells and then empowers that believer at conversion. And then as we surrender our spiritual gifts, or surrender our wills to the Lord and serve God, there is a spiritual gifts that begin to manifest and we begin to experience God do a transforming work in our life. So when we do that and we experience God work in that way, we need to recognize that there is something that has switched as it relates to where the power of God dwells. The power of God dwells in believers as the temple versus the buildings, the places that were once there. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says this, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Something significant happened in the New Testament. <clears throat> Something significant happens as it relates to how the Holy Spirit indwells people. What the church was supposed to be, the place of worship. The place of worship just moved to the hearts of people. We become the body of Christ. We become the temple. We become the dwelling place that God works that where God indwells us and it's interesting and I've, I've said this before but if we've been bought with a price is God getting his money's worth so to speak are we surrendered in such a way that we reflect God because if we are the temple of God what was the temple of God supposed to do people came from all around to meet with God in the temple to worship God in the temple and so now that the Holy Spirit lives in us People should see God in us. Our lives are designed to be sort of as we're the temple of God, that we would give testimony and witness to God. The purpose of, this, of the Holy Spirit empowering us to be the temple of God is, the, is so that the people around can see God at work in us. That they, if they want to meet with God and find God, that they should be able to come to us and be able to find God because God's at work in our lives. So, we do that, we become salt and light. We become the city on the hill. We become the place where people can discover who God is. And uh, there's three ways that we should be a witness. One is just in the legal sense. If a witness, you know, the, the purpose of him indwelling his, or, or filling us with the spirit is so that we could be his witness. One is in the legal sense. A, a witness is someone who testifies to truth. And so we should testify to the truth of God. There's also an, a historical sense. Usually, you know, you, you, you're like, were there any witnesses? Can anybody uh, verify that this happened? And the disciples were witnesses in verifying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they were witness to that. But the last thing is in an ethical sense. And uh, the word witness, martus, I believe is the Greek word, there's a sense of someone who is willing to, to die. Martyrs were witnesses to Christ. They had a belief that such conviction that they were willing to give their life for that. They were witnesses. They were martus. And, and there, there's a sense here that when the Holy Spirit empowered these believers, they were going to be these witnesses. They were going to testify the truth. They were going to verify the resurrection. They were going to verify with their very lives who Jesus was. And it was going to start there in that city, Jerusalem. It was going to expand to Judea, Samaria, and it was going to go to the ends of the earth. And that's what you're going to see through the book of Acts. You're going to see the Acts. It's interesting because you look at the other books of the Bible and they're usually named after a person or a place. You know, you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, you know, Romans. You've got the places then. The, but when you get to Acts, it, it's not named after a person or a place. It's named after the Acts of the Apostles, but yet at the same time, the Apostles aren't the heroes in the story. 
it really is that the empowered apostles, after the Holy Spirit comes upon them, do we see these magnificent acts and we see them become witnesses. Now, I have been concerned, as many people have, about what a witness should look like when you're in ministry, especially you're concerned, how can we make sure that we are a witness in the community? I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to try to tell the edited version because this is not a college audience and there's kids online listening, so here's my edited version of this story. Um, several years back, we were at the Arboretum in college, doing college ministry, and it was a men's night event. And, you know, anytime you get a group of guys together, you've got to be nervous about what kind of witness you're going to be in the community. So I was a little nervous, God pray that we're a good witness while we're in the Arboretum because the general public could be in the Arboretum. And we're talking about like a late at night, maybe, I don't remember what time, maybe 10 o'clock at night or so, 11, I don't know. So there could be general public around and we're playing capture the flag and we've got the guys split up in groups and we're running around and chasing flags and there's always some injuries. We had uh, Andy Moore, a friend of mine, he got a stick in the eye one night and he had to go to the ER to get the stick taken out of his eye. Uh, He's fine, though, now. But I'm always nervous. Oh, Lord, help us to be a good witness because I'm afraid that somebody's going to do something stupid. And there was. So they, there was this guy that got this bright idea. That, and if you don't have to play capture the flag, it's like there's, you know, one flag on this side, one flag on this side. You've got to sneak over and steal their flag and bring it back to your side. Well, this one guy got the bright idea that if he snuck over wearing nothing but his birthday suit, nobody would touch him. And so he decided to run through the, the woods at night wearing nothing but his birthday suit. He was wrong. They did touch him. They tackled him. And then you've got some other issues to deal with. And the only thing that I could think of is, great, I can't wait until this makes the newspaper and you know it's going to be what the headlines are going to read about a Christian organization and I, I just was like this is not going to go well for us and what's ironic now by the way that now that this has passed is that particular student is way removed 10, 10 plus years removed from uh, from college is now a police officer <laughs> true story he really is uh, but I was nervous. You're like, that is not the kind of witness you want representing the organization or being a Christian. And there are, so two things from that story. Number one is you really, we really do need to be concerned with what kind of witness we're being for others. What you might think is innocent and only involves you and a few others really doesn't. Everything we do is a witness, good or bad. We are representing something to people that are observing. And the other thing that that story encourages me by is that even if you've been a bad witness, you can experience a different path. I love it that the guy's a police officer now. He would not endorse that kind of behavior. And so perhaps you're here and you're like, man, I have called myself a Christian for years and I have not been a good witness. I have been a terrible representation of Christ I want to encourage you to from this moment on say all right I am going to be the type of person that follows Christ that I'm letting God empower me with his spirit I'm surrendering to him and I'm going to represent him well I'm going to testify of his truth I'm going to bear witness to his work in my life and turn back to God in the next few weeks we're going to see Peter and John do this they're going to be a witness in Jerusalem and I want us to consider as a, as a wrap up I want to share some opportunities with the next few minutes um, I want us to consider for us what should we be doing in our community what should we be doing in our state and, and region and what should we be doing in our world I want to get very practical matter of fact I was thinking a lot of the things that the early church probably talked about in their homes were specific and practical ways that they can actually serve. And so I want to spend the last few minutes of this sermon talking about some specific things that we can do <coughs> also to make you aware of things that are going on. So if you got this handout on the way in, and you could check our website as well uh, if you're watching online, 
but I want to talk about some service opportunities and some practical ways that you could help serve in the church right now. Uh, the first thing that I want you to be aware of is a prayer walk. That at 6 o'clock on some of these dates, uh, the 20th, the 18th of October, 20th of September, 18th of October, if you want to meet at the church, we're going to, we're going to get in groups uh, that will be social distance to be able to go out and pray over the city. Some things we want to do. Also want you to be aware that we want to help serve our elderly. We were praying a couple of probably weeks, months ago about how we can be more outward focused in our communities. And just like Tony did the Bible spot for the kids who are at home, we've created our own Bible spot. We actually recorded three of them this past week. Uh, we're going to show up once a month at three different nursing homes. So I think it's Sundale, Mapleshire, and Morgantown Rehab Center. Uh, they will get gift packets from us. So once a month, each of those nursing homes will get a gift packet from us. And in that gift packet, two of the three places will have snacks, personal notes for all of the folks that are at the home. Uh, Tony and Children's Church with the kids will be making some gift things for them. They'll get their gift bag and they'll watch a special like Bible spot where some of the pastors and elders will make a specific sermon message for them so that they could be ministered to during this time as well. And so that's something that we need some help assembling care packets. Something that some of the students need community service hours. Uh, let us know if you want to help with that because Ruth, Barb Pluchuk, uh, Bill and Mary Sack, we've all been working on this project together to be able to help better serve the elderly in our communities. Uh, we have food pantry. Uh, we're starting our food pantry back up again. You can see various dates where we'll be packing. There's a lot of dates on that list. Uh, we meet in the foyer here. You can pack these. Uh, it's just like you, there's a lot of food on the table. You'll have gloves, masks. You'll put on uh, things in baskets or not in bags rather to prepare to, to help feed people. And we want it to be evangelistic as well. We want to talk to people about their faith. And so we want to make sure that you're aware of these opportunities to do that because we don't want to be a church that just sits around and waits on this to clear up we want to be a church that actively help this is when people need help the most how selfish is it, is it of us to just say I can't wait till things get more comfortable again so we can just fellowship and hug and and sing songs and I, I'd love for that to happen man there's people that are fearful that are hurting that need help man this is our time to shine church this is our time to be a witness to trust that God wants to use us Gathering Gives, another opportunity I want you to be aware of. Uh, this is partnering with a lot of organizations here in our city. Uh, we're going to be collecting uh, career clothing, supplies for children, uh, school supplies. Also be aware that Operation Christmas Child, if the school supplies will fit in a shoebox, that would be great. We'll be collecting those. You'll see bins in the foyer as well as a large bin outside under the carport. Uh, but we're collecting things to help people out. You can read more about that. Chestnut Mountain Ranch, if you don't know what Chestnut Mountain Ranch is, it is a place that helps take care of boys, troubled boys, or boys that need some help. Um, it is a wonderful ministry. Uh, Steve Finn, I, I would encourage you to get to know their website if you're interested in that. So what, what, what we're going to do, some of the things that we're going to do is that they're building a new home for the boys up there, and they've got teams coming in and working on those homes and they need cleanup crews to come in and so we're looking at like bringing a few people up doing some cleanup maybe putting down some insulation playing some kickball with the with the boys helping create some paths there's just a lot of service projects that we can have as we are praying for that ministry and different things that we can do and Carl Marion is leading that up uh, but there's a lot of wonderful things with feed the homeless even if you haven't helped with our feed the homeless ministry uh, I would encourage you to do that. It's a life-changing perspective, and we're also trying to do something a little different than we've done in the past. We want to come alongside some of the people that have been there for a while who aren't either uh, have a, a mental disability or not on drugs and try to help them get on their feet again. Somewhat of a discipleship program so we can meet with them, help them grow. Uh, last but not least, I want you to be aware of the Compass Women's Ministry. This is a ministry that has really helped get struggling uh, pregnant women get the resources they need to choose life. The resources they need, whether it's through adoption or helping taking care of a child. But, but Compass has helped many families in our area in a variety of ways. 
And so if you'd like to get involved with that, there's, there's, there's all of these volunteer opportunities. And none of them are on a large scale. They're all small scale. Even without going into details, you can see the display that Tony made out there. We have, those are the local things. We've got local, state, and global opportunities. I'm just kind of highlighting some of the local stuff right now. In the coming weeks, when we get to Judea, Samaria, I'll, I'll start highlighting some of the other things that we do as a church. But I encourage you, if, you, if you're not serving here locally, do something. Uh, one of our partnerships is with France, and we are going to be praying with their prayer team. And if you'd like to be a part of that, the Zoom call is the first Sunday of every month, 1 o'clock. A lot of upcoming volunteer opportunities as well. Just read this. Just find out how you could get involved. So, I don't know what God's called you to do. I don't, I, I don't but we're the ecclesia. We're, we're the church. And here's what I do know. God has not called a single person in the ecclesia to be a spectator. No one has been called to fill a pew. We are called to serve and be the church, to be empowered by God. So, just want to wrap up in this. Uh, be, let's be a witness. Let's trust God for the power and let's be a witness. Let me pray. Jesus, help us to honor you. Help us to be the church in your power, not our own. God, would you help us to be a witness? We want to represent you in this place. We know we can't do that in our own strength. So we look to you, God. Empower your people to be the people of God, the body of Christ. And I pray that people would see you in the works that we do and give you glory. God, teach us as we go through Acts how to be your people that represent you well, how to be your church. In Jesus' holy name we pray.